testing questions. No, we're not going to do that. Welcome to Crossroads again. Uh, if you are visiting with us for the first time, I'm Reed Robinette. I'm a senior pastor here. We are thrilled that you've joined us today. You know, before we launch into uh, this new message series, I-, I wanted to make a comment on a couple of things that you've heard already this morning. Number one being uh, that it has been uh, a heavy time in our congregation, and we have had these memorial services, and I I just want you to know that I am so proud uh, of our team, uh, of volunteers, and of staff. It was really, in many ways, our finest hour to be able to serve some families that were in need. Um, Two of the services weren't even folks that were connected here. We just hosted um, so that families could be taken care of. And you might know that's one of our values, that it's not about us. Um, It's about the kingdom of God. And we felt like it was a win for the kingdom um, over the past several weeks. And so to put on five services every weekend is an enormous task. And to add three more on top of that, uh, these uh, I just am so proud of our team. And I wanted to say thank you to everyone who was involved. And... um, one last week, uh, we had an opportunity for people to join some small groups, and over a hundred people, for the first time, um, jumped into a group. And so, way to go! If that was you, I, I just applaud your effort. Um, we will try not to mess it up and, and contact you and 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 all that. But uh, I just want to say, way to go! And maybe if you missed last week, uh, you might have noticed there's a, a, a table out in the foyer again. And so right after this service, if if you're not connected yet in a group, we'd love for you to stop by and to check that out. Now, this is a brand new series of messages, and the title is, I Know You Are, But What Am I? Which might be the most bizarre message title that we've ever come up with uh, here at Crossroads, because you remember the context, right? You've probably said that or heard someone say that, maybe when you were really little, on on the playground, right? When somebody would call you a name or make fun of you, you'd go, I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? You remember that? And uh, it's annoying if I would say it over and over and over again, so I'm not going to do that. And you might think, this is odd for a church. Um, It is. But I'm not going to call you names. I'm not going to make fun of you. I am, however, potentially going to offend some of you. And I know that. And you might think, well, that's strange. If you know that you might be offensive, why would you continue with that kind of message? Because I mean to offend you. (laughs) I'm actually trying to offend you over the next several weeks. I remember my homiletics professor, Dr. Pinnell. He was this wonderful African-American preacher, and I was in his class at Fuller Seminary, and he said in this booming baritone voice, you know, he would say, your job as the preacher is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. I said, oh, that's really good. I write that down, you know, that's like, that's good. And you know what I've learned, though, over the past oh, lots of years uh, doing this is almost everyone thinks that they're in the category of afflicted in need of comfort. And almost no one thinks they are in the category of comfortable in need of affliction. How many people would have signed up to be afflicted today? No, you wouldn't. No, almost nobody thinks that you fit that category. But that's what I'm going to try to do over the next several weeks. I, I, weeks. I'm going to try to stir the pot a little bit, and it might be offensive to you. Um, but I'm in good company because Jesus did this all the time, right? Jesus certainly uh, comforted the afflicted. Think of the woman, uh, the hemorrhaging woman had had this issue for years and years and years, spent all she had, just got worse. Jesus comforts her, heals her of that affliction. Think of the paralytic, and Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk. He comforts this guy. But Jesus also afflicted some of the comfortable people, did he not? Especially the religiously comfortable people. He called them whitewashed tombs at one point. Uh, he, there's, a, there's a sermon that Jesus gave. You can look it up. It's in John chapter 6. And it's so challenging that people left and stopped following Jesus at that point. They said, this is too hard. Who can accept this teaching? 
And I said to Elizabeth, my wife, this week, I said, this might be my John 6 moment. Like, I might get finished preaching this sermon, and you all go, that's it. I, I can't, you know, I mean, the donuts are great, but I got I to gotta draw the line. This is no good. I, I get that. So why am I going to do it anyway? I'll tell you. Because the potential reward for getting this topic right is so great. It, for you personally, for us as a whole congregation here watching online in Hampstead, for the whole, in many ways, for the whole kingdom of God, if we would get this right, the benefits are just enormous. And the great thing is, you'll know whether you get it right almost immediately. You know, like the feedback loop for this teaching is almost instantaneous, which is not true for many, many other things that we talk about here. In other words, sometimes I teach on something from the Scripture, and you don't know right away whether you've gotten it or not. It takes a long time. Let's take, uh, we might talk about the peace of God that transcends understanding. How do you know whether you got that? or not. And that takes a long time to figure out, or whether it was even true what I was saying, you know, about the topic. This one is almost immediate. You will know whether you got it in the next three weeks or not. So you ready? You want to be offended? Well, too bad. I'm going to do it anyway. So um, do you want to know? Here's the topic that could potentially be so offensive. Ready? I'm going to teach you how to be generous. Look, you're like, that doesn't sound so bad. But then start to think about it for a minute. I'm going to teach you how to be generous. You say, wait, wait. Are you saying that I'm not generous? Yeah, I am. I'm saying that most of us, not all, most of us think that we're generous and we're actually not. And so I'm going to try to teach you something that you think you already know. And quite Possibly you're going to get offended as as I do that. And don't feel bad about me saying that you're not generous because here's what you need to know. Generosity is not natural. Did you know that? If you have kids, can you testify to that? Did did any of them just naturally want to share everything that they got right from the beginning? No. If you were a kid, you know this, right? It doesn't come naturally to us. So if you've never been taught, if if you've never learned how to be generous, you likely don't know. Now, you'll confuse it with giving. I believe everyone here knows how to give. And and many of you give to different things on different occasions for for different reasons. In the United States, giving is sort of a a socially acceptable more a, a practice. People don't do it in great quantity, but uh, lots of people give. That's different than being generous. And and so I'm going to try to teach you something that you think you already know. Now, here's a little barometer. If you think you're a generous person already, you might be. Here's one way that you'll know. All of the top, all of the content over the next several weeks that I talk about, about generosity, will just be super exciting to you. You'll just love it. You'll be so encouraged and want to encourage other people. Why? Because you know the joy that's been produced in your life by living according to the truth that we're going to talk about. So if you are a generous person, you can't wait for week two of this series. You'll be so excited about it. But on the other hand, if you just think you're generous but actually you're not, What you will respond to is in a very different way. You will probably feel defensive uh, to some of the things that I say. You'll push back. Uh, You will probably think of all sorts of different rationalizations and justifications of why you don't do the things that I say generous people do when you still think that you're generous and I say that you're not. If that's the way you feel, that's okay. I understand that because I'm trying to teach you something that you assumed you already knew how to do. So before we move into the scripture, let me just try to define what it is I'm talking about. What it is that generosity actually contains. Because it's different than giving. Giving is something that you do. 
Generous is something that you are. Does that make sense? Now, being generous is reflected in what you do in, in your giving. But it starts, listen, listen. Being generous is a heart condition. It has to do with something that you are before it has to do with something that you do. Generous is more than just money. It, it, but m- listen, money is an extremely accurate gauge of your, your heart. Jesus is going to teach us that in just a second. Generous is not about quantity. It, it, it almost never is. And it gets confused in that way. I hear this phrase a lot. Oh, what a generous gift that was. And almost every time what somebody means when they say that is it was a large dollar amount. And here's what I'm going to tell you. That has nothing to do with generosity. Only the person giving it will be able to tell whether that was a generous gift or not. That the same dollar amount for one person would be extremely generous and for another person, not at all. Because it has to do with the state of your heart that produces the action. All right, I'm going to give you a definition. Uh, I love it, but it's the uh, most clunky, non-rememberable definition that you'll ever hear, okay? Uh, If you looked it up in the dictionary, this would not be the definition that generosity would have. But I like this one. I'm going to give it to you. I found it uh, two weeks ago. Generosity is... The premeditated, calculated, designated emancipation of personal assets. That's snappy, isn't it? (laughs) No, no, it's not at all. But it's incredibly insightful. It says that generosity is the premeditated. That means it's a decision made prior to being asked for anything. Hmm? It it is a calculated, it's, it's determined already, not by circumstances, but by the way that you live, designated, right? It, that, that it's not just whoever has the loudest voice or, or the most recent um, demand. It's designated because of what you believe and, and what is near to your heart, the, the way God has wired you. And then the last part, emancipation. You know what that word means? Freeing. It means that there's this uh, generosity produces a freeing of the stuff that you have. It it doesn't control you in any way. You free it up. What you've been given, it gets freely passed on. That's what generosity means. And most of us don't know that. I, I have a long way to go in learning about how to be generous. Now, one last thought before we look at the scripture for this morning. Generosity, though, is a completely spiritual topic. In other words, when you begin to receive the love and grace, forgiveness, mercy of God, and it starts to transform you, one of the natural occurrences will be a generous heart. I'll say it another way. As God molds us, changes us to be more like his son, Jesus, we will naturally become more generous. And so the converse is also true. If I'm not becoming more generous, I'm not becoming more like Jesus. And that might be offensive to you. But Jesus connected those two things. The spiritual transformation and the heart of generosity in this amazing encounter that he has with a young man who's often referred to as a rich, young ruler. So that's what we're going to look at for the rest of the morning. If you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke 18, verses 18 to 27, records this incredible encounter that Jesus has and, and teaches us, Oh, some really important lessons if we're going to grasp the concept of generosity. Listen, I'll start in verse 18. It says, a certain ruler asked him, that would be Jesus, asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. 
You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad. Because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with men is possible with God. Now, this is God's word. And in this one encounter, I think Jesus teaches us three critical lessons if we're going to grasp the truth about generosity. I think he teaches us, number one, being rich is hard. Number two, being sad is avoidable. And number three, being generous is a response. One, being rich is hard. Two, being sad in this sense is avoidable. And number three, being generous is a response to something. Let's learn those lessons together. Number one, this is all about rich and hard to begin with, right? It, this guy is talked about as, as a rich person. Uh, it says in the, the key verses that, that how hard it is for these rich people. Uh, It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into the kingdom of God. To which most of you react, well, thank God that doesn't apply to me. (laughs) Right? I know what you're thinking. Well, it stinks to be a rich person, I guess, you know. Uh, There are a lot of things that I am. Rich is not one of them. if, If I did this, hey, raise your hand, all the rich people in the room. Exactly, right? You know. And it turns out that you're thinking, like, well, if there's any benefit to not being rich, here it is. I don't have to worry about what this means because it doesn't apply to me. And it turns out that that understanding is completely wrong. And even if you, we were to do a little poll in the room, here's what we'd find out. That your definition of rich is different than the person over here's definition of rich. The Gallup poll uh, did a survey, I've shared this before, and they found out that those were actually the findings. They asked people, what, how much money does it take for you to make that will make you rich? And it was all over the map. The, the people who earned under $30,000 said $74,000. That's what would make you rich. And some of you were like, dang right it would. <laughs> 74,000. Some of you are like, 74,000? My, how would anybody live on that, right? It, because it's, we're all over the map. People from 50 to 100,000, 30 to 50,000 said, if you make 100,000, that's the rich people. The, the people who had a net worth of $5 million or more, they said, oh, no, no, no. It has to do with after tax income. If you have, if you have right, they had 250000 of after tax income, then that makes you rich. And it's just all over the, no one thinks that they're rich. And so when I read to you Jesus' words that say, how hard it is to be a rich person spiritually, you go, well, it doesn't apply to me. It does. Here's the truth. Most of us are crazy rich. We just don't act like it. I'll I'll tell you, all of us in the room almost are in the top 4% of wage earners in the world. Did you know that? Almost all of us are in the top 4% in our country. We have things that are unheard of in other places in the world. Most of you have a car that is at your disposal for you. That is unheard of in most places of the world. Some of you have more than one car for your family, yes? That's cr- that puts you in like the top half a percent of people in the world. Some of you have more automobiles than you have people in your family. Does that? <laughs> yeah. 
that's like, I can't even imagine. Many, many of us, me included, have rooms in our homes that no one lives in. They just, we keep them in case someone would come by and would need to live there. They're called guest rooms, right? That's unheard of in most places in the world. Some of you have a guest room for your car. <laughs> it's called a garage. Your car doesn't live there much because you got all kinds of other stuff. You have too much stuff, and so it has to go in the, the car's guest room, right? That's unheard of in most places in the world. We, the truth is that we are rich, and it is hard. You just don't think of it that way because you never consider yourself to be a rich person. And yet, when I start telling you the hard parts, you'll go, oh, yeah, no, I do that. Yeah, I, I struggle with that. Why? Because you are rich, and it is hard, spiritually speaking, to be rich. How so? Well, it makes it harder for you to be generous. Let me say that again. Being rich makes it harder for you to be generous. This is just a fact that on average, as income goes up, percentage of giving goes down. Just a fact. I know what you're thinking. Many, many of you think, as soon as I make a little more, I'll be generous. No, you won't. It's just not true. That this makes it harder for you and for me to be generous. We're, we're rich. And it makes it hard. It creates an illusion of security and identity, right? The more money you have, the more likely you are to rely on it. You, the more likely you are to identify yourself by it. You think you're smarter because you make more than somebody else. You know what you're better at? Making money, that's it, <laughs> than the person who makes less than you. That's it. You're not wiser. <laughs> you're not more care. You're not anything else other than just Better at making money. See, being rich uh, creates this illusion and starts uh, to make it difficult for us to pursue spiritual transformation, including generosity. So, if you're keeping track at home, I've suggested so far in this message that even though you think you're generous, you're probably not. And even though you don't think you're rich, you probably are. So, how many people are offended so far? Oh, well, I'll keep going then. Here we go. Uh, at least it's not boring, right? And so uh, the truth is that, that this fellow exemplifies how hard it is spiritually to be rich. And in fact, it says he goes away sad because of his wealth. But he doesn't have to, nor do you. So that's no point number two. Lesson number two is this. Being sad in this way, spiritually, being uh, your growth in Christ being truncated, uh, you hit a dead end in your spiritual transformation, that doesn't have to happen. Let's see why. The question Jesus was asked that starts the whole thing is, what do I have to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? The fair question, uh, normal question. Rabbis in Jesus' day were asked it all the time. In fact, Jesus has been asked the same question multiple times. And his answer seems very normal and reasonable. What does he say? He says, well, obey the commands, which might seem very normal and obvious to you. Unless you read two paragraphs before where Jesus says almost exactly the opposite. So, see, two paragraphs before Jesus is making a point, and he, he contrasts these two individuals. He says, there's one who's a Pharisee, that's a religious elitist, and there's one who's a tax collector. He's like the bottom of the rung, right? And, and he says, the Pharisee thinks that God will be pleased with him, that he will be justified before God because he's kept all the commands. And Jesus says, that's not going to work for him. And in fact, it's the tax collector who leaves justified before God. Why? Because he pleads for God's mercy on him. And so Jesus has just gotten finished making this point. Don't count on following the commands to justify you before God. In walks our rich young ruler and says, Jesus, what must I do to be justified before God? And he goes, 
Have you heard of the commands? And you're thinking, wait, what? You just got through saying, that's why I love the Bible. <laughs> it, because you have to read the whole thing, right? You can pluck out any one verse and make it say almost anything. That's a whole other sermon series down the road, right? We should probably do that. Um, and don't you love that Jesus doesn't have a, have a model, have like a, a pre-fixed you know, speech that he gives? And nor should you, by the way. That's a whole other sermon series, you know? That he talks to individuals because they're unique. And what he says to this one is stunning based on what he just said before. So he says, well, how you doing with the commands? And one of the guy says, check me off. Since I was a boy, all of them perfectly. And if I was Jesus, I would have been, well, I can't do that in church. I coughed and said something at the same time. But you know what I'm saying. But Jesus doesn't do that. And so what does he do? He looks at him and he goes, okay. And then he gives him one very specific command. Now, why didn't Jesus answer? You just need to receive grace from me and in faith follow me. Why didn't he say that? I don't know. But it seems to me that if he would have said that, the guy would have said, check. Whatever religious you know, thing Jesus would have come up with, the guy probably would have said, I checked a yes box on that. Maybe you would too. So Jesus gives him a, a, an undeniable barometer, an unavoidable test to see what's going on inside of him. He says, okay. You know, the first command is this. Don't love anything more than you love God. How are you doing on that one? I think he would have said, great. And Jesus said, okay. Well, let's see. Sell it all. Sell all your stuff. Give to the poor. And then come follow me. Because you will start to experience life like you can't imagine. What happened? He walked away sad. Why? Because his money wasn't just his money. His money was his identity. His money was his security. His money was his meaning. And so when Jesus said, well, free that up. Just let it go. He couldn't do it. And he walked away sad. But he didn't have to. It was, it was avoidable. He stood at an intersection and had the opportunity to embrace generosity. But he couldn't. And so he didn't. And he left sad. But he didn't have to, and neither do you. Well, how do you do it? How do you embrace, how do you move towards generosity? This is lesson number three. Lesson number three is that generous is a response. A response to what? A response to the rich young ruler. You say, well, God didn't even get it right. <laughs> no, 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 not that one. A response to the other rich young ruler in the story. Did you see him? There were two. See, Jesus, at this point in his life, is probably 31, young guy. Jesus has wealth beyond imagine at his disposal. The Bible says that everything that is created was by him and for him. He owns it all. He is a ruler of the universe. If there ever <laughs> was someone to be called a rich young ruler, it was Jesus. And what does he do? He says, you need to follow me. See, who can make such a bold claim, such a ridiculous ask of someone? Only the person who would go there first, hmm? right? And is there a better example of someone who had everything but didn't hold on to it, but poured it out? And the greatest act of generosity on the planet was the richest ruler becoming poor for our sake. He poured himself out. Everything he had. Why? Because he was so doggone in love with you. <laughs> and if you don't get that, generosity is out of the picture. 
If you get that, generosity is a response to the rich young ruler that showed, that, look, I had at my disposal everything, and I'm willing to give it all up. In Matthew and Mark's gospel, it says he looked at him and he loved him. And he said, oh, because I love you, I want you to experience this. But he didn't, couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. How about you? I'm going to stop here. I think I've been offensive enough for today. But here's what I want to tell you. I told you, you'll know whether you got this or not really quickly. Because the feedback loop is, I want to challenge you to begin to live generous lives. And you can't do that without becoming givers. Th that's the way that you will demonstrate this, this heart that is overflowing with what God's given to you. And I know that's hard. I, I, I understand the realities of life. And, and so we want to, as a group, give a, 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 an on-ramp that we could all take. Hmm? That, that we that would be doable and you could you could start you could move towards generosity in a way that would release stuff in your life that would be beyond why because Jesus needs it no but because he loves you and wants you to experience this so here's what we've cooked up we're going to call it uh, the generosity giving challenge right and this is it so starting this week, if you would decide, all right, I'm going to, I want that. I, I want to see what that's like. We want to give you the opportunity to do that in, in this way. If you decide over the next, we'll do it for three months, 90 days. I'm going to give regularly for 90 days. And then regular it means different things to different people. Maybe it's bi-weekly, that's the way you get paid, or maybe it's monthly, or maybe it's weekly. That doesn't matter. Nor does it matter the quantity at this point. We'll talk more about that later on. But if you would take a bold step and think this is maybe true, I need to move towards generosity if I claim to be a follower of God, then we want to make it as... Um, as approachable as possible. So if you do that, you enter this 90-day challenge. At the end of 90 days, June 1st, if you think, oh, I regret ever doing that, God didn't show up at all in my life, we'll give you all the money back. We'll just return it to you, no questions asked. We, I so want you to just try and see that God will meet you as you begin to give. It's time to stop saying that you're putting God first in your life when he's last on the list. Or not on the list. At all. He could, some of you hadn't quite made it onto the list yet. It, I, want, I want you to, why? Because I love you. Now, I just want you to do that. Now, if you don't trust us, give it somewhere else. Honestly. But they won't probably give you like the money back guarantee. Like if you give it to somebody else, don't come to us asking for the money back at the end of the time. You understand what I'm saying? And you have to sign up for it. You have to tell us you're doing it. And it has to be like you can't get to the end and go, I gave $100 bills every week unmarked, lots of them. And so I would like those back now, you know. Can't do that. Um, but in all seriousness, if you would try this, I am so confident that God would meet you as you begin to put giving to him first on the list a and see what happens over the next 90 days. If he doesn't meet you, it's a savings plan for you. We'll give it back to you, right? Trust me, God's going to meet you in some incredible ways. Now, um, we'll talk more about specifics next week. I promise you that if you have teenagers or, um, and by the way, you should start soon if you're a teenager. Don't wait. Because I know if you're 20-something, you think like, well, as soon as I start making, burp, 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 right, that's not going to work. Start now. But if you have 
a teenager or a 20-something, um, you bring them next week. I guarantee you, you'll be glad that you did because they'll be better at taking care of you when you get old. <laughs> because of what I'm going to tell them about how to handle money next week, okay? So, so do that. We're going to end our service this way, though. Every time God asks us to give something, it's in response to what he's given to us. And I know no better example of that than the Lord's table, than receiving communion. Because in just a second, what are we going to do? We are going to receive the body and blood of Christ. The pouring out, the generous display of his love for you. And that's what you get to receive. Before you ever give, you receive. I'm going to invite the worship team to join me on stage. And if you're serving communion, would you come forward at this time? And as they do, would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your generosity, for the way that you gave your only son. And I pray, God, that we would be motivated to become more like him. I want that for me. I don't want to just give out of obligation or obedience. I want to become generous like you are. I want that to be my heart. And I want that for every heart in the room. So as we receive, God, would you change us? Transform us? Start from the inside out. God, we receive gladly what only you can give us. Through the cross, the forgiveness and mercy and grace that we so desperately need. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.